History records that Cleopatra staged a glorious exit. She killed herself with a deadly snake. I think that the death of Cleopatra is probably her greatest moment. What a fabulous exit. But is it the true story of Cleopatra's death? Now, one of America's leading criminal profilers, Pat Brown, has reopened the case. It's a story that's been accepted for 2,000 years, but Brown suspects it may be wrong. As a cold case investigator, I noticed this particular crime scene and said, this is very unusual. There seems something wrong with the, the way it is described she died, and I'm just not sure I quite believe it. For a decade, Brown has profiled some of America's most notorious criminals. And she's a veteran of the Washington sniper case. It's always difficult to investigate a crime scene after it's gone cold. It's going to be one heck of a job, but I, I think it's possible. I think, I think it can be done. Brown is applying her skills to an ancient crime. Her investigation uncovers an incredible story of conspiracy, intrigue, incest, and perhaps even murder. begins her investigation in the city from which Cleopatra ruled Egypt over 2,000 years ago, Alexandria. One of the most important things you do in any cold case is to go to that crime scene, because if you don't go there, you don't even know what you're looking at. Cleopatra lived and died in this once magnificent city. Its famous monuments and royal palaces have long since disappeared into the city's huge natural harbor. Today, virtually nothing remains of Cleopatra's world. And the elusive queen herself hides behind the many masks that history has placed upon her. Since her death, Cleopatra has been reinvented as an icon, subject to the enduring fascination of some of history's greatest artists. She's a woman, she's a queen, and she's a queen of Egypt, and Egypt is the most fascinating, exotic, distant, extraordinary country that has ever existed. So over the ages, artists and writers, they've all been able to embroider on the idea of Cleopatra, and they've created a different character. To find the truth of Cleopatra's death, Brown will need to unravel centuries of history, distinguishing between fact and fiction. She begins by seeking out the original accounts of Cleopatra's suicide in Alexandria's modern library. Once the site of the most famous repository of knowledge in the world, the ancient library of Alexandria was destroyed during Cleopatra's reign. Brown has arranged to meet Egypt's leading classic scholar and expert on Cleopatra's era, Professor Mustafa El Abadi. But he has a surprise for Brown. There's no first-hand account of Cleopatra's death. What is the actual first source we have that says anything about Cleopatra? Well, the sources are actually second-hand sources, even the ancient ones. Even the ancient ones? Even the ancient ones. The records of the Roman historians Plutarch and Dio Cassius are considered to be the most accurate accounts of Cleopatra's suicide. However, they were written over a century after she died. What both historians agree is that she was imprisoned inside her mausoleum on the day of her death, according to Plutarch. When they opened the doors, they found Cleopatra lying dead upon a golden couch, dressed in her royal robes. But as they pore over the texts, Brown discovers serious inconsistencies. Plutarch suggests Cleopatra killed herself by smuggling in a deadly snake hidden in a basket of figs. Dio Cassius mentions a pitcher. And both also propose an alternate version which has never been seriously entertained, poison. 
I found there were so many inconsistencies that I couldn't quite put my finger on if this happened or if that happened. Plutarch uh, was a storyteller, in a sense. Do you then believe it's possible that he also took artistic license in his writings? Mm -hmm. Possibly, yes. <laughs> yes, certainly, yes. Brown then finds something that throws the case wide open. Plutarch actually acknowledges that he does not know exactly how Cleopatra died. But the truth of the matter, no one knows. The truth of the matter, no one knows. Nobody knows. But you know. for certain, we have no means of knowing how she died. 2,000 years of history seem to have been built on the shakiest of foundations. We really don't know what happened at the scene. So I'm going to have to go back and analyze what could have occurred at that scene, and does any of that make sense? While she examines recent archaeological finds from Cleopatra's city, Brown is considering the options. If the ancient sources cannot be sure exactly how Cleopatra died, then Brown must approach it from a new angle. She decides to launch a forensic investigation. What she is about to discover will challenge a story that has been accepted for centuries. Egypt's last pharaoh, Cleopatra, was said to have died tragically by her own hand. But criminal profiler Pat Brown is suspicious of history's verdict, suicide by snakebite. Her investigation now takes her to the crime scene, ancient Alexandria. Only now, it's underwater. 300 years after Cleopatra's death, her royal palace was swept into Alexandria's harbor. Today, it is one of the most remarkable archaeological sites to be found in Egypt. Brown is exploring the ruins of a city that has been lost for centuries. Well, I wouldn't say the crime scene still exists. Uh, we have a sort of vision of the crime scene, at least a feeling for it. Somewhere here are the remains of Cleopatra's palace and the mausoleum where she died. But now, little is left of the ancient city, and Cleopatra's mausoleum has never been found. It's clear that Brown needs to get a more accurate picture of the place where Cleopatra died. She turns to a man who has spent a decade exploring the remains of Cleopatra's city, underwater archaeologist Jean-Yves Empereur. The continent line, the coastline is here. Okay, so it's very different right from what we, we see okay. now. Today, Alexandria's modern coastline bears little resemblance to Cleopatra's age. Empereur can give Brown a picture of the royal palace district, describing the location and architecture, but above all, he can identify the site of Cleopatra's mausoleum. So we have a palace here, a mausoleum there. Yes. Which is, yeah. she could then easily get back and forth between oh, the two yes. of them. Oh, yes, yes, of course. With Empereur's evidence, Brown decides to rebuild the place where Cleopatra died. Drawing on the details of Alexandria's ancient maps, archaeology, and modern underwater survey data, she sends the information to a team of computer graphics specialists. The team will create a 3D architectural model of Cleopatra's palace complex, including the mausoleum. While she waits for the reconstruction, Brown turns her attention to the victim, the next step in her investigation involves her own unique skill, criminal profiling. People don't behave out of character in the moment of a crime. They do what they think is logical. Brown wants to find out if Cleopatra fits the profile of a suicide victim. People commit suicide when they can't stand being alive, when they're in such intolerable pain, they're sometimes continuing to live 
Oh, if they believe that by dying they will gain something that they can't gain otherwise. The question is, is there anything in Cleopatra's story which fits either? Although there is no clear consensus as to the exact nature of her suicide, most scholars do agree on the extraordinary events of Cleopatra's life. Born in 69 BC, Cleopatra was a descendant of a long line of Macedonian Greek royalty. Called the Ptolemy dynasty, her family had ruled Egypt for over three centuries. She grew up in a fabulously wealthy royal court during one of the greatest intellectual revolutions in history. From the beginning, Cleopatra was actually one of the most cultured, intelligent women that had ever reigned as a Ptolemy. Alongside her brothers and sisters, Cleopatra had a remarkable education. As a child, she mastered seven languages. But Brown discovers an unexpected detail. In the nurseries of the Ptolemy family, Cleopatra learned other realities of royal life. Incest. Her mother and father were brother and sister. There was another thing the Ptolemies liked to keep in the family. Murder. The Ptolemies is a family. To say that they are dysfunctional is an understatement. <laughs> they are the most extraordinary lot of people ever to have ruled Egypt. It's a story of murder, of incense, of corruption, of blood, and she is the last survivor. Brown's perception of Cleopatra is shifting. Clearly, she had to fight to live. For Cleopatra, it was kill or be killed. Cleopatra learned very, very well from her family. She learned that if people get in your way, you eliminate them. She's going to learn what works and what doesn't work. And if she wants to be a queen, she's going to have to take in all the methodologies that are going to make her a queen. But there is one key detail that Brown finds extremely revealing. The Ptolemy family had no history of suicide. That I know of, no Ptolemy has ever committed suicide. Generally speaking, they don't die a peaceful death. There was no family history of committing suicide, even though there was a family history of murder. So this would have been out of character for her. Aged 18, she inherited the throne of Egypt. With it came marriage to her much younger brother. But when he challenged her power, he was soon discovered dead. Her other siblings met a similar fate. Fearing her own assassination, Cleopatra courted the might of the Roman Empire. She became the lover of Julius Caesar and gave birth to his son. But when Caesar was murdered, she was forced to find another ally. She seduced his confidant, Mark Antony. Together, they launched a bid to rule the Roman Empire and failed. Brown's profile paints a picture of a woman who would never just give up. Looking at Cleopatra, one of the most important details is that she never quit fighting. She never gives up. It's not making a lot of sense to me that she would just kill herself at that moment. Brown's next step is to combine Cleopatra's psychological profile with the just completed 3D model of the crime scene. It's a tool that will allow her to visualize Cleopatra's death. ancient Alexandria. Based on historical and archaeological research, Pat Brown now has the most accurate possible reconstruction of Cleopatra's royal palace and the mausoleum where she died. Having concluded that Cleopatra is not the type of person to kill herself. I now have to prove it. For two millennia, history has told us the story. On the day Cleopatra died, Plutarch records this sequence of events. 
Cleopatra is imprisoned inside her mausoleum. Despite this, a deadly snake is smuggled in. She sends a suicide note to her captor, Octavian, who is lodged in her palace. And then she locks herself inside. First, Cleopatra is struck, and then her two handmaidens. When they are discovered, Cleopatra is dead, and her handmaidens are dying. Two tiny pinpricks are found on her arm. There's just some things that just jump out, red flags, we say. If you're constructing this crime in your mind, can you imagine three women trying to apply a snake to themselves, especially the handmaidens after they see their mistress drop to the floor? I mean, the likelihood of them wanting to grab the snake themselves is, is, is you know, oh, it's a snake, and a poisonous one at that. People are frightened of snakes. Brown now wants to test just how likely history's version could be. Travelling to Cairo, she has arranged to meet a leading expert in snake venoms and ancient poisons, Professor David Worrell. He has brought her to a little-known corner of Cairo called Abu Rawash, known in Egypt as the Snake Village. Here, Professor Worrell introduces Brown to the prime suspects. So, who is this guy here? It's the famous Saharan desert horned viper. He's a neat-looking guy. Wow. This was a very well-known snake uh, in pharaonic times. It is a dangerously venomous snake. So I shouldn't get too close. But it's, its venom is relatively slow-acting. How long would that take, though, for a person to actually die? It from... would probably take uh, a matter of days or even mm -hmm. a week. So this know. is not really likely to have been the particular snake that no, was I, involved I, in Cleopatra's death. Although the desert horn viper has been cited as a possible cause of Cleopatra's death, I completely reject this idea <laughs> as, as being totally implausible. This is the one to concentrate on. This Ooh, is wow. the best one, the top candidate, Egyptian cobra. This is Egypt's most impressive venomous snake. It's the largest, it has the most potent venom. Mm -hmm. The venom is neurotoxic. It, Which means what? Well, the toxins block the transmission of the nerve impulse. Okay. So there is a progressive paralysis. Once Cleopatra was struck, the venom would have first paralyzed the muscles of her eyes. Then it would have frozen the muscles of her chest and stomach. Finally, she would have suffocated and died. Little physical evidence would have been left on her body. You would have fang marks. Uh, to... they, they're noticeable fang marks? Yes. Well, okay. can, they can be very tiny, even with a large snake. A description that matches the earliest account of Cleopatra's corpse. Professor Worrell also thinks that one cobra could inject enough venom to kill all three people. This amount of venom that we see here, would this be just, would just a fraction of it be in one bite? Yes, probably okay. it, would only, it would only inject a few drops at each strike. This is a lot of venom. But all the evidence now suggests that repeated strikes, even up to 10 strikes in a row, can deliver lethal doses of venom. At first, Professor Worrell's testimony seems to support the snake bite theory. But days later, Brown notices a crucial detail in the layout of the crime scene which could challenge the story. Cleopatra's mausoleum was very close to her palace, where Octavian was lodged. The mausoleum and the palace, they're just several hundred meters apart. It's a very short walk. Brown realizes that it would take the guard only a few minutes to travel from the mausoleum to the palace with Cleopatra's suicide note. And little more than a few minutes to return and find her dead. Brown needs to know how long the venom from an Egyptian cobra would take to kill Cleopatra. The most rapid evolution to death that I've experienced has been uh, two hours, but uh, shorter times than that have been reported. Could have been as short as 15 or 20 minutes, but much more likely it would have been a matter of a few hours. History records that her handmaidens also died seconds after the guard arrived. 
meaning that all three victims must have died within the shortest possible time. Cleopatra had sent over a note to Octavian. That guard would have been back there very quickly, and he would have found Cleopatra alive. But that's not the only problem Brown finds with the story of suicide by snakebite. Not every strike by an Egyptian cobra contains lethal venom. Even if you're bitten by a venomous snake and the fangs puncture your skin, uh, there's probably only on average a 50% chance that venom will be injected. The odds that all three victims died from a single snake bite is at most a remote possibility. I think that someone as wise, as intelligent as Cleopatra seems to have been, it's unlikely that she would have relied completely on the, on the snake venom to do the job. Brown then notices something else that casts doubt on the snake bite theory. According to Plutarch, no evidence of a snake was found in Cleopatra's mausoleum. And indeed, the asp was never discovered inside the monument. When a suicide is committed, you usually have two things, a body and the implement of death. Because once you're dead, you cannot yourself remove that implement of death. Cleopatra committing suicide and handmaidens committing suicide, what happens to the things they used to do so? Brown's evidence is turning her away from the accepted version of Cleopatra's death. But why have generations of historians believed the story? On the walls of one of Egypt's great temples, she thinks she might have found a reason for the account. It's an explanation which will take Brown's investigation in an entirely new direction. Criminal profiler Pat Brown has serious doubts about the story that Cleopatra committed suicide by snake bite. But before her investigation dismisses 2,000 years of history, she wants to find a reason for the account. She's on her way to southern Egypt to investigate a place that hints at the origins of the snake bite story. Entirely surrounded by water, the magnificent temple of Philae was built by Cleopatra's dynasty. Oh, hello, Pat. How are you? Egyptologist Professor Saeed Gohari explains the myth of the temple and its patron goddess, Isis. And you see the figure of goddess Isis everywhere. In Egyptian mythology, the goddess Isis was the universal mother goddess. Professor Gohari shows Brown a carving that connects Cleopatra to the goddess and the snake. Look at this very important relief here, showing Isis in the middle. And she is providing Egypt with water and the plantations. The whole scene being protected by the snake. Can you see the head of the snake? Yeah, right there. And this relief shows the connection and the relation between Cleopatra and Isis. Brown has discovered that what is accepted as historical fact could actually have originated from a myth. When Cleopatra became pharaoh, she did not just become a queen. To the ancient Egyptians, she also became the living incarnation of the goddess Isis. And the symbol of the goddess Isis was the Egyptian cobra. Furthermore, the snake that adorned her headdress was an emblem of kingship. From the moment she was crowned, Cleopatra's destiny was entwined with the serpent. I think one can certainly draw a parallel between the symbol of kingship and the death of Cleopatra. This uh, very, very dangerous animal, the cobra, which is there to protect the queen of Egypt, uh, is in fact, in the myth, the ultimate instrument of her death. In Pat Brown's judgment, the story that history has recorded for 2,000 years makes more sense as a myth than as a factual account. But if Cleopatra didn't commit suicide by snake bite, then how did she die? 
Brown now turns her attention to the other suicide theory. Plutarch's records suggest an alternative account of Cleopatra's death, suicide by poison. He even explains how she did it. She carried poison about with her in a hollow comb, which she kept hidden in her hair. To investigate the poison theory, Brown turns again to Professor Worrell. He can identify the types of ancient poisons used in Cleopatra's time. In Cairo, he takes her to a market where they can still be purchased today. The really interesting thing here is that <clears throat> in Cleopatra's time, a wide range of poisons were available and understood and, and were and used. And she would understand them because she, she was would. very well educated. She had all I the believe access. she was an experienced poisoner. I can see up there there's the spotted hemlock. This is a plant poison. The active principle is coneine. This is the poison which uh, bumped off poor Socrates in 300 BC, so it was very well known. Okay. And it would cause a, a slow but not too unpleasant death. But, I mean, there are plenty of other possibilities. For example, we have, um, I think I can see there, some arsenic. This is yellow arsenic. Yellow arsenic, wow. So and it's a pretty raw. Yes, pretty and deadly. This uh, would also cause a death, but a very unpleasant death, an agonizing death. So I wouldn't recommend this. You think the number one uh, poison that Cleopatra might have used would have been the hemlock? That would certainly be a very possible contender. Brown asks a leading poisons unit based in New Zealand to analyze hemlock. Dr. Leo Shep is making a highly toxic concentrate from the leaves of a hemlock plant. He's trying to determine exactly how much poison is needed to kill Cleopatra and her handmaidens. The cone may hold one to two mils of liquid. She would need 30 mils to kill herself and an additional 60 mils her servants. It's highly unlikely that hemlock would have been responsible for her death. But perhaps Cleopatra got the poison another way. Brown wants to know if Hemlock could kill Cleopatra in the few minutes between sending her suicide note and the guard finding her dead. Dr. Shep's results suggest it couldn't have happened. Well, that's interesting. But death is typically within hours of in ingestion. So it would have taken too long. It, there would have been signs on her body. That doesn't make sense. So, this whole suicide thing is just illogical. What's interesting about Cleopatra is that she doesn't fit the profile of those who, uh, leaders who, when they lose, commit suicide. And she can go through losses and still persevere. She's a survivor. So the idea that she would, in the face of a loss, commit suicide just doesn't hold water. If it's true that she didn't commit suicide by snake bite or poison, then what really happened to Cleopatra? Brown now believes suicide by any method is extremely unlikely because there is one critical detail that makes it implausible, the suicide note. Only minutes before her death, Cleopatra wrote a suicide note and sent it to her captor, Octavia. That's not what people do when they really want to commit suicide. People don't write suicide notes and give them to other people. They usually write the suicide note to leave them by their bodies. It's a revelation which changes Brown's investigation into a murder inquiry. If she's right, then Pat Brown is now in search of Cleopatra's killer. I'm going to be looking for somebody who had the opportunity, the ability, and the motive to commit this crime against Cleopatra. If it was a murder, then who could have done it? To Brown, there is only one possible suspect, Cleopatra's captor. Well, I'm mean, only one person who controlled the crime scene. So I'd say Octavian looks like a very good suspect. Octavian is now Brown's prime suspect in Cleopatra's suspicious death. To find out whether he fits the profile of a killer, 
Brown will have to travel inside the mind of a man who conquered Egypt and defeated Cleopatra. Octavian, the grand-nephew of Julius Caesar, was named heir of his estate. But he also inherited Caesar's political ambitions to turn Rome from a republic to a dictatorship under one strong leader, himself. His plan was to gain sole power. He wanted to gain all of the honors and positions that he was entitled to. One obstacle blocked his path. A man who also nursed ambitions to become sole ruler of Rome, Mark Antony. In the wake of Caesar's death, Mark Antony ruled the Eastern Roman Empire, while Octavian controlled the West. But Mark Antony's dream needed finance. As Caesar had before him, he began a liaison with Cleopatra. Octavian had found a weapon. He fought a vicious smear campaign against them. He used Mark Antony's relationship with Cleopatra to create an image of Mark Antony that was denigrating, that presented him as unmanned by this Egyptian whore. Octavian cannot attack Mark Antony, who is his rival. So he will attack Cleopatra and create a myth about her, which is everything that Rome hates. She uses sex to lure these poor men. She's a murderess, and they describe her as a prostitute. Finally, their confrontation escalated into a war for the prize of the Roman Empire. Using Cleopatra as a pawn, Octavian played a calculated game. When Octavian actually declares war, he chooses to declare war on Cleopatra. And in doing so, he turns this war into a war against a foreign queen, rather than into a war against another Roman general. Octavian's victory was devastating. When he conquered Egypt, Mark Antony committed suicide, and Cleopatra became his prisoner. The Roman Empire was finally his. Brown's profile of Octavian is beginning to take shape. He is a brilliant chess player. He's trying to eliminate her bit by bit. And when it comes down to the crime scene, the last days of Cleopatra's life, there he is. He's in, in Alexander. He's got control of the mausoleum. And now he's going to call the shots, and he's going to make happen what he wants to happen. But the ancient sources claim Octavian actually wanted to capture Cleopatra alive. They say he intended to humiliate her in a triumphant procession on the streets of Rome. It was quite a common practice to take the vanquished kings of foreign countries and show them off in Rome. If it's true, then Brown has a problem with the motive. She's traveled to Rome to find out more about Octavian's character. After defeating Cleopatra, Octavian became the first emperor of a new era. He changed his name to Augustus after the month he conquered Cleopatra. He built Rome into a magnificent city and its lands into a vast empire. Brown wants to see the remnants of Octavian's world. In the midst of the city's busy modern streets are the remains of a once lavish temple that was built by the emperor. Classical archaeologist Dr. Laurie Anne Touchette shows Brown what's left of the temple that Octavian dedicated to his patron deity, Mars, the god of war. We're coming up the steps of the Temple of Mars Altor that was dedicated by Augustus to Mars the Avenger. So he's continuing the tradition of relating himself to the gods to give him that kind of power in front of the people. Absolutely. It's 
interesting that just after Octavian arrives in Rome, one of his first acts is to hold games. What happened? The games began. A comet appeared in the sky. And so Octavian could present this comet as Caesar, who indeed was a god. From that point on, he calls himself Dewi Filius, son of the divine. <laughs> How lucky for him. He actually has to rewrite himself in the same way that he manufactured an image of Cleopatra. As what? Create himself as the savior of Rome. It's clear that if Mark Antony had won, we would have a very different vision of him. But most revealing of all are Octavian's own memoirs. His grandiose self-portrait, entitled The Accomplishments of the Divine Augustus, may have influenced the works of Plutarch and Dio Cassius. There's some suggestion that they were actually following the memoirs of Augustus. And so we have this possibility that they're presenting Augustus's own view how he wants to see the suicide of Cleopatra portrayed. If Octavian controlled the written history of Cleopatra's death, then perhaps the story that he wanted her alive was just another piece of propaganda. When one analyzes the issues, one sees a very odd thing that there are more reasons to want her dead than to want to drag her through the streets in this triumph. The best enemy is a dead enemy. And if Cleopatra lived to go to the triumph in Rome, who knows what would have happened. Octavian probably considered this very well and thought, it's not worth it. Octavian had opportunity. Cleopatra was his prisoner, and he had the ability. He influenced the written accounts. But did he have a motive for cold-blooded murder? Everyone needs a reason to kill. They don't just do it. Even what people call a motiveless crime is not motiveless, it's only we don't understand it. Now, Brown is searching for a motive. She believes it is in Egypt that she will find the evidence that could identify Octavian as the killer of Cleopatra. Brown believes her investigation has cast doubt on history's verdict of Cleopatra's death, suicide by snake bite. She's even discounted suicide by poison. Now she thinks Cleopatra was murdered, and she's closing in on a possible killer, Octavian. Brown is hunting for the final clue that gives him a motive for murder. Returning to Cleopatra's homeland, she has come to an ancient Egyptian temple that Brown hopes will provide the missing piece of the puzzle. Professor Gahari meets her at the temple of Dendera. And here is Cleopatra to the left, wearing the crown of Afra in Lower Egypt. Look at her figure here. She, she's full of confidence. In glorious relief stands Queen Cleopatra, bearing gifts for the goddess of music and love, Hathor. Look what she is holding in her left and right. She is presenting these two emblems to goddess Hathor. In front of her, her son Caesarion, wearing the crown again of Upper and Lower Egypt. And that's Caesarian. And in the image, he isn't simply her son. He is her equal, her co-regent. It's a significant clue. Cleopatra is showing him here as the future king. And she is trying to say that he will be able to rule the whole world. Brown could have found the motive. Caesarian. He represented a personal challenge to Octavian. Because he was Julius Caesar's son by birth, Caesarian had a claim of his own to become the emperor of Rome. 
she becomes co-ruler with Caesarion, setting him up to take his place as the rightful heir of Caesar. The child is the threat to Rome. I mean, Cleopatra is a threat in her own right, but the child is the biggest threat to all because he is the direct descendant of Julius Caesar, who has no other children. In Pat Brown's judgment, Octavian would stop at nothing to destroy Caesarion and Cleopatra. Looking at this depiction, I can really see why Cleopatra was such a threat. This wasn't a woman he could buy off easily. This wasn't a woman who's going to go away. This is a woman who saw herself and her son ruling over a huge empire, and she was always going to be a thorn in the side of Octavian. Caesarian's fate is a chilling addition to the story. Only days before Octavian had arrived in Alexandria, Cleopatra sent the 17-year-old Caesarian south towards Ethiopia. But after the death of Cleopatra, Octavian had him hunted down and killed. It's interesting that our sources brush over the murder of Caesarian. It's not seen as an important issue. And it, again, I think we're dealing with Augustine propaganda, with his ability to rewrite history after the time. the story of Cleopatra's death makes sense to Brown. Drawing on all the evidence from her investigation, she has reconstructed what she believes to be a plausible account of Cleopatra's death. It's not history's version, but her own. Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt, is imprisoned in her tomb in the besieged heart of Alexandria. On the night of Cleopatra's death, Octavian faced a very difficult choice. He could keep her alive and have this wonderful triumph, or he could kill her and eliminate the threat he had in his life and into his, to his future. That was the true goal he was seeking, and therefore I believe he chose to murder Cleopatra rather than take her to Rome. So he sends his men to do the job for him. He's got total secrecy there, and he can control everything and make it look like a suicide. So he wanted to murder her, but he wanted to make sure that that murder was not attached to him. And then he could create a story to distance himself from that crime. He simply says, I wasn't there. This is a wonderful cover-up. Brown's version of Cleopatra's death could be the true story. But will it hold up under the scrutiny of leading experts? Nicole Dueck has examined her case. Pat Brown's conclusions are certainly worthy of more attention. What she has done could inspire people like me and others to think again, why not? She was not that woman that could be defeated easily. She always looked at the future. I think that she was killed in a different way at last, Pat Brown is satisfied that she can close the case on Cleopatra. It's been 2,000 years since Cleopatra's death, but I believe that it was a murder, and I believe we found the murderer. Cleopatra was 39 years old when she died, the last pharaoh of a glorious civilization. After 3,000 years, the Egyptian empire came to an end. With her death, Octavian absorbed Egypt into his new empire. But the defeated queen may have ultimately won the war. Ironically, it was Octavian's own propaganda that ensured a myth was born. The story of her extraordinary life and tragic death 
has inspired our greatest artists. And 2,000 years on, it is Cleopatra who has become one of the most enduring female icons in history. Coming up next tonight on Five. Somewhere under this desert lie tombs. They could contain mummies decorated with gold and clues as to who they were. The Golden Mummy Tomb Opening, live on Five. Original accounts of Cleopatra's suicide in Alexandria's modern library. Once the site of the most famous repository of knowledge in the world, the ancient library of Alexandria was destroyed during Cleopatra's reign. Brown has arranged to meet Egypt's leading classic scholar and expert on Cleopatra's era, Professor Mustafa El Abadi. But he has a surprise for Brown. There's no first-hand account of Cleopatra's death. What is the actual first source we have that says anything about Cleopatra? Well, the sources are actually second-hand sources. Even the ancient ones. Even the ancient ones. Even the ancient ones. The records of the Roman historians Plutarch and Dio Cassius are considered to be the most accurate accounts of Cleopatra's suicide. However, they were written over a century after she died. What both historians agree is that she was imprisoned. History records that Cleopatra staged a glorious exit. She killed herself with a deadly snake. I think that the death of Cleopatra is probably her greatest moment. What a fabulous exit. But is it the true story of Cleopatra's death? Now, one of America's leading criminal profilers, Pat Brown, has reopened the case. It's a story that's been accepted for 2,000 years, but Brown suspects it may be wrong. As a cold case investigator, I noticed this particular crime scene and said, this is very unusual. There seems something wrong with the, the way it is described she died, and i just not sure I quite believe it. For a decade, Brown has profiled some of America's most notorious criminals. And she's a veteran of the Washington sniper case. It's always difficult to investigate a crime scene after it's gone cold. It's going to be one heck of a job, but I, I think it's possible. I think, I think it can be done. Brown is applying her skills to an ancient crime. Her investigation uncovers an incredible story of conspiracy, intrigue, incest, and perhaps even murder. begins her investigation in the city from which Cleopatra ruled Egypt over 2,000 years ago, Alexandria. One of the most important things you do in any cold case is to go to that crime scene, because if you don't go there, you don't even know what you're looking at. Cleopatra lived and died in this once magnificent city. Its famous monuments and royal palace inside her mausoleum on the day of her death. According to Plutarch, when they opened the doors, they found Cleopatra lying dead upon the golden couch, dressed in her royal robes. But as they pore over the texts, Brown discovers serious inconsistencies. Plutarch suggests Cleopatra killed herself by smuggling in a deadly snake hidden in a basket of figs. Dio Cassius mentions a pitcher and both also propose an alternate version, which has never been seriously entertained. Poison. I found there were so many inconsistencies that I couldn't quite put my finger on if this happened or if that happened. Plutarch uh, was a storyteller, in a sense. Do you then believe it's possible that he also took artistic license in his writings? <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> yes, certainly, yes. Brown then finds something that throws the case wide open. This is 
have long since disappeared into the city's huge natural harbor. Today, virtually nothing remains of Cleopatra's world. And the elusive queen herself hides behind the many masks that history has placed upon her. Since her death, Cleopatra has been reinvented as an icon, subject to the enduring fascination of some of history's greatest artists. She's a woman, she's a queen, and she's a queen of Egypt, and Egypt is the most fascinating, exotic, distant, extraordinary country that has ever existed. So over the ages, artists and writers, they've all been able to embroider on the idea of Cleopatra, and they've created a different character. To find the truth of Cleopatra's death, Brown will need to unravel centuries of history, distinguishing between fact and fiction. She begins by seeking out the original